So without further ado, let me turn this over to uh, uh, Jim Wade, uh, WB8SIW, uh, who is the, uh, Jim, what is your title? Uh, I'm uh, Emergency uh, Management Director for Radio Relay International. I also serve as Secretary for the Corporation. Excellent. Thank you. Please take it away. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I'm going to go through some of this pretty quick. <laughs> we have uh, some information to cover. A uh, fairly extensive program. Uh, I'll try and kind of pick and choose through the topics to give you uh, everyone here a pretty good overview and uh, hopefully uh, answer some of your questions in advance. So we can uh, save some meeting time here for everybody. Uh, and again, uh, uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm in Houston and over here, of course, it's 12.07. So good morning or good afternoon to everybody. How's that? Uh, so let me share the screen and uh, we'll get busy on this and uh, see where we need to go. So, Slideshow started. Okay, can everybody see this okay? Yep. Okay, excellent, excellent. So again, my name is Jim Wades, and I'm representing Radio Relay International. And of course, Radio Relay International was founded in 2016. It's a nonprofit 501c3 public benefit corporation, an NGO. And of course, so we're dedicated to the modernization, development, and uh, maintenance of an international messaging system. Now, uh, many of you have heard of NTS, National Traffic System. Uh, RRI was essentially formed out of the assets of the National Traffic System. Uh, and uh, it, recently we've kind of taken to kind of informally calling it the INTS or, or the International Traffic System, uh, simply because uh, once RRI took over, uh, we began looking at modernization and and further development, we've attracted uh, affiliated nets as far away as uh, Asia, Oceania, uh, places like New Zealand and Australia and Hong Kong, Fiji, you know, places of this nature. Uh, so, uh, and of course we have a very extensive presence in Europe via the digital traffic system. Uh, so uh, we, we kind of call it the informally, the, the INTS or International Traffic System. But many of the aspects of NTS obviously remain, particularly at the section level, um, in terms of uh, at least the manual mode uh, functions, the network topology, and so forth. I won't cover them in great detail, uh, but we've also adopted uh, several other additional programs that are designed to, to promote the purposeful use of two-way radio, uh, to integrate, uh, let's say, um, uh, grassroots uh, VOADs, uh, neighborhood organizations and so forth into the emergency communications framework. Uh, these being the national SOS radio network, uh, the neighborhood ham watch program, uh, Boy Scout radio watch program and so forth. Uh, but with just an hour to go through this, I'm not gonna touch a lot on those programs. Uh, we do offer a, a fairly extensive course entitled uh, Introduction to Radio Relay International, our training program TR002 where we cover a lot of this stuff in detail and uh, would encourage those that want to learn more uh, uh, after the presentation today to uh, go have a, a look at that. So obviously we were uh, an organization formed by traffic operators and uh, in, you know, therefore our core mission remains traffic networks. And we believe traffic networks have significant value. Uh, uh, number one, they inculcate basic communication skills that are universal to all emergency communications environments. So proper use of pro words and, and uh, uh, radio communications procedures, uh, proper use of the ITU phonetic alphabet, uh, the ability to uh, convey important technical information accurately and efficiently. So for example, if I, I'm asked to transmit a, a complex technical term such as one comma, one comma, one, dimethyl chlorohexane, I can say dimethyl, I spell Delta India, Mike, Echo, Tango, Hotel, Yankee, Lima, dimethyl, chloro, I spell, et cetera, right? These kinds of skills that aren't really unique to traffic handling, but the nature of traffic handling as an operating activity 
uh, develops these skills and any radio amateur who might be called upon to serve as a, in his community in time of emergency. Uh, the ability to transcribe important data and to do so accurately and completely and uh, retain appropriate radio logs for tactical message traffic. Uh, incident commander comes to you and says, what time, uh, what time did the EOC indicate that the, that the uh, hazmat team had departed or what its ETA was? And you can look at a radio log and say, yeah, that was 3.13 PM uh, or, or something of that nature. So the very administrative skills that go with traffic handling, uh, recording, oh, I forgot to mute the phone. Yeah, bear with me a minute. Uh, uh, the very administrative skills, you know, that uh, go uh, hand in hand with handling important third party message traffic. It's, it's developed on a day to day basis. In addition to this, of course, we have the issue of uh, community outreach, routine radiograms are an opportunity to uh, introduce members of the general public to the nature of amateur radio, our, our role as a uh, as an emergency communications or community service. Um, it's something unique that can be a challenging and fun uh, operating activity. But, but perhaps most importantly, in keeping with part 97 and the like, uh, the very process of establishing nets, maintaining nets, uh, interacting with other radio operators on nets, uh, builds not just a, a uh, infrastructure, but the 365 day a year operation promotes what one might call operational readiness. It establishes uh, individual relationships and builds community. And these things can be leveraged in time of emergency uh, to uh, provide additional resources for uh, anybody, ARIES groups, uh, individual radio amateurs, OXCOM, uh, whatever the case might be. So again, our core mission remains traffic networks. And of course, uh, you know, part of our job is to create an apologia for traffic handling. So you'll often hear radio amateurs make this comment, uh, you know, uh, do traffic nets compete with the internet or email or, or perhaps a, a better way, they'll make an assertion that, well, who needs traffic handling or radiograms in the era of the internet, uh, email, cellular data networks. And, and, and the point that I always reply to this is that amateur radio networks have never been able to compete with the capabilities of uh, commercial common carrier telecommunications services, right? Uh, the circuit capacity and the amount of data that Western Union or Postal Telegraph might have handled in 1920 or 1940 or 1960 far exceeded anything amateur radio could have done at the time. Uh, you know, the Bell system, uh, you know, modern cellular data networks. In reality, amateur radio has never been in competition uh, with uh, commercial telecommunications common carriers. Uh, we've never been able to offer their level of service, but what we do offer is survivability uh, through uh, decentralization and dispersal, okay? Uh, so in other words, uh, you don't have these distributed networks of important nodes and choke points and things of this nature, which provide great utility in a commercial service. But what you do have is you have dis dispersal throughout a disaster area already in the form of actual operators and their skill set. And you also have, of course, uh, decentralization. That is, uh, networks can be intuitively uh, reconfigured and managed to uh, dynamically respond to a disaster situation. So essentially, you know, we have very reliable uh, commercial telecommunic telecommunications uh, infrastructure uh, in North America, but occasionally failures occur, you know, right? Or earthquakes, uh, major hurricanes, wildfires, such as the campfire, uh, you know, uh, there's the potential for cyber attacks and IED. So, for example, I was in Nashville uh, uh, immediately after the uh, after the uh, uh, IED exploded, the bombing of the telecommunications central office in downtown Nashville, and there were widespread uh, cellular network uh, failures throughout um, a good percentage of Tennessee and parts of Kentucky. Uh, literally, 75-80 percent of Tennessee had no cellular service. 
So while the commercial infrastructure works great when it's available and it's becoming ro more robust with time, uh, we do still occasionally fill gaps. We, just as government agencies have to plan for the worst case scenario, in many respects, amateur radio is the telecommunication service of last resort. And as such, we have what you might call the fiduciary responsibility to also plan for some of these worst case scenarios. Uh, furthermore, as we all know, you know, amateur radio continues to provide what one might call these value added services uh, to served agencies, uh, additional communications capabilities, additional skills, be it technical, um, the ability to communicate and so forth. So emergency communications remains relevant and training for that, building network infrastructure, building community always has value in preparation for uh, basic emergency communication services. So if you look at our philosophy, uh, when we took over management of, of the national traffic system at the infrastructure level, uh, obviously we looked at the existing infrastructure uh, the manual mode nets, for example, and uh, also our new digital, well, not particularly new, but our developing digital traffic network. Um, and we decided that there's great value uh, in the open architecture. So for example, uh, the traffic system offers universal access. Uh, so for example, uh, you walk into any amateur radio station and the odds are pretty good, it has a microphone, and it has a transceiver, okay? whether that's a VHF uh, transceiver or a high frequency radio transceiver. And uh, you can pick up that microphone and provided you have the training and the experience, you can check into a radio telephone net and you can originate message traffic. Um, every radio transmitter built since the 1920s has radio telegraph capability. And if you have that skill set, you can access the traffic system, right? And then, of course, we have uh, digital nets. We have some sections that have, uh, you know, uh, say fuzzy mode nets or uh, the like. And of course, our digital traffic uh, network is built on as a, a designed as a hybrid mesh network uh, using automatic forwarding and traffic distribution based on software uh, and handshaking throughout the network um, using technologies like Pactor 3 and the like. But so, so the idea is we want to preserve that, that universal interoperability, universal access, and while also uh, inculcating professional standards. Uh, so I, I have a very strong background in designing uh, emergency exercises. So uh, for example, uh, you know, port security exercises, counterterrorism exercises, bioterrorism exercises, and whatever you do in an emergency exercise, uh, you have to be able to measure performance. So you have to, you have to, for example, the exercise has to be realistic, it has to be attainable, and it has to be objective and measurable. Okay. So a lot of radio amateurs believe that they are prepared to provide a service to their community if they can establish connectivity. But establishing connectivity is not communications, it's just one piece of communications. Uh, so for example, uh, a served agency official tenders a message for origination. Uh, that message has to be uh, entered into say a, a terminal or it has to be placed on paper. Somebody has to transmit it or inject it into the network. Then it passes through the network. It arrives at the other end of that network then that message has to be delivered, okay? Maybe it'll be sent straight to the message router in an EOC, but then again, maybe not. Maybe it's addressed to a public safety official who's in the field, and that message has to be taken from the radio operator in the EOC and placed on a public safety talk group to get to its destination, okay? So now we begin to look at all the little intricacies of that. I may have digital connectivity between my incident command post and the EOC. I can send all kinds of complex information, upper and lower case, lots of abbreviations, et cetera. But if at that EOC, it's gotta be transferred, say to a public safety talk group via say a 911 center, some of those nice value or those capabilities of mixed case and so forth begin to disappear. 
uh, circuit capacity diminishes on a voice net. Uh, uh, for example, uh, let's say we have 30 radio operators in our ARIES group, all of whom have, hypothetically speaking, the same amount of communications traffic of relatively the same priority. If you look at that, and you look at it mathematically against a in a temporal context against the timeline that means each operator has only two minutes out of every hour during which he can convey important communications traffic so we need to look at things like brevity we need to look at simplicity we need to look at interoperability how can a message flow between two or more radio networks how can it be transferred from an amateur network to a public safety talk group or to uh, maybe another radio service. Uh, these are all things that, uh, you know, have to be taken into account. So by uh, professional standards and infrastructure, we want to look at the entire communications process, and we have programs and policies through which we feel that we can accomplish this in a realistic manner that will withstand uh, the test uh, in time of emergency. And this is not to suggest that we're going to dictate to any one ARIES group on how they do things locally. We're not in the local ARIES business to start, but we are here to support ARIES groups in a responsible and professional manner when called upon to do so. So ultimately, what it really boils down to is our goal is to develop a quality program based on this universal access, universal interoperability, professional standards, non-political management methods to isolate the traffic system from the egotism and hidden agendas that sometimes pop up in the amateur radio world. And in the process, we create a quality program that attracts quality people. Uh, and in turn, through that promotes not just amateur radio, but the purposeful use of two-way radio technology in the public interest. So uh, again, uh, our goal is to have an open international messaging uh, infrastructure that provides that universal access, uh, that interoperability that's open to local radio clubs, uh, local MCOM units, uh, individual radio amateurs who might find themselves providing, uh, say, a communication service for their neighborhood uh, in time of emergency. Um, and in doing so, we're going to develop, maintain, and promote uh, RRI voice and CW nets, uh, local, um, uh, say, digital nets of various modes. And of course, uh, then we provide the infrastructure to tie all of this together, right? Whether it's the digital traffic network or our manual mode network system. So when we took over uh, management of the traffic system, um, we basically began looking at well, we did what you might call an assessment, right? So in 2015, the administrator of FEMA, Craig Fugate, uh, asked that uh, NTS be tested as part of Cascadia Rising. So we were tasked with providing connectivity between Alaska, Washington State, Oregon, Northern California, and Idaho uh, to the National Response Coordination Center in Washington, D.C. and uh, I was given the job of developing a, a let's call it a professional quality uh, disaster telecommunications exercise. So uh, we actually have a class on how we went about doing this, what the methodology is. It's entitled uh, Designing a, uh, a Disaster Telecommunications Exercise or an Emergency Communications Exercise. Uh, and one of the very first things we had to realize uh, recognize is that nobody had ever developed the national response plan for the traffic system. No such animal exists. Well, you can't really create an objective emergency management exercise evaluation process until you see what the plan says, okay? You see whether or not the plan is realistic and attainable, okay? So in 2015, as a uh, prelude to developing the FEMA exercise to test this amateur radio capability, we developed a uh, national response plan for the traffic system. Then once that was developed, we put together a methodology to see if the prototype plan would actually work. 
Well, this created some politics, et cetera, the usual unwanted politics, the kind of ego-centric infighting that occurs sometimes within the broader amateur radio community. It's not worth going into here. But ultimately, uh, the, uh, the performance of the traffic system in Cascadia Rising uh, resulted and uh, was actually quite outstanding. So, for example, uh, the point-to-point -point radio telegraph circuit scored 99.998% accuracy against uh, over 10,200 some odd data points. I don't have the exact statistics in front of me. Um, and uh, average message propagation times, that is the time measured from when a message is tendered for origination until when it appears in the data stream at the National Response Coordination Center, measured in say the range of 10 to 13 minutes on average. Uh, the digital traffic system scored an accuracy rate of 99.997%. Um, but actually, some people look and they say it's impossible. You know, how could a, how could a, uh, a uh, even though the difference is de minimis, you know, how can a uh, uh, radio telegraph point to point circuit score a higher accuracy rate than digital? And I laugh, you know, well, of course, Pactor's automatic error correction, uh, correcting, but somebody still has to type the message into the terminal, right? <laughs> so, you know, that's where the errors occur. But, but the point being is that the, the, the success was uh, quite good. We did learn some lessons from it, though, too. If, if you don't have a properly designed emergency management exercise, and if there aren't failures or shortcomings, then it's probably not a properly designed exercise, right? So uh, we proceeded to, uh, since then, develop a set of national emergency communications response guidelines. And so, for example, these guidelines outline an activation request uh, procedure and a message format for doing so. So for example, if San Diego Aries plans to use the traffic system, one of the plan obviously requires that the emergency management director or his designee be notified of this. Now you might ask why, and we'll touch on this in another slide, but that's because there's two configurations for the traffic system. There's routine, which is our day-to-day -day configuration, where messages aren't time sensitive and you know they, it takes them 24 hours to arrive, it doesn't matter, but then we have to have an emergency configuration and we have to uh, control the emergency response function and any dynamic changes to network topology to support that emergency operation. So the plan dictates uh, a formal activation request procedure, specifies alert and notification for the members of the traffic community. Uh, it uh, manages circuit capacity through load balancing, the establishment of specialized circuits, uh, defined volunteer tasking, uh, network assignments that is maybe activating specific networks uh, based on disaster scope, assigning certain networks, watch frequencies or point to point circuits to certain priority level of messages. So for example, if we have uh, messages going to that National Response Coordination Center that would typically be priority precedence messages, then that would be the network assigned. If we have high volumes of traffic, such as welfare traffic, that needs to be handled efficiently without a high level of administrative burden at the local level, say at the ARIES level or local NTS level, then we would prefer digital traffic network to be used because you can basically upload those as batch files then the network itself parses that message traffic and distributes it to its point of destination, okay? And the digital traffic station function at the delivery point then is responsible for the last mile of, of connectivity. Uh, the Winlink RRI interface, uh, you know, again, you know, plays a role in this. So what we would do typically in an emergency upon being notified that the traffic system is going to be used or is currently in use is we would basically put together a, you know, an emergency uh, bulletin. And we would specify, you know, the preferable way to route traffic, manage traffic flow, load balance, et cetera. Uh, we have a specialized message formats, uh, a situational awareness reporting format, an operational readiness report format, a weather observation format, things of this nature. Uh, so for example, in a widespread disaster, uh, or a, a major disaster where there's fairly high volumes of communications traffic, we assign a network management coordinator. Uh, each 
station that's active on the traffic system transmits an operational readiness report. This operational readiness report indicates what agencies he has connectivity with, what ARIES group, uh, what nets he's connected to, okay? And what happens is our network coordinator will go ahead and populate an ICS, modified ICS 205 spreadsheet. Uh, this allows us to search. So for example, if somebody in Washington, DC were to come to me and say, we need to get a message to Glensbury, Idaho, okay? I can look at that uh, uh, spreadsheet and I can say, okay, we have this net, uh, this operator that's connected to that agency, and uh, this is the best routing to expedite that message through the system to get it to its destination based on its priority. Okay, it's time sensitive value, you might say. And uh, uh, there's a variety of other factors I, I'm not going to take a lot of time getting into. For example, defining the connect frequency and download frequency for the digital traffic station function or for the WinLink RRI gateway function. Uh, we can change these things dynamically in time of emergency. And so this is why we have an emergency management director, and this is why we, uh, we have an emergency plan, is to ensure that the traffic system responds dynamically uh, to whatever disaster telecommunications requirements might arise. Now, it's not enough to have a plan if you don't exercise it and regularly and train your personnel. So uh, one of the things that RRI did beginning in 2017, is we implemented a series of, of generally quarterly emergency exercises and drills. So sometimes these test specific network functions, uh, perhaps uh, sometimes they just provide familiarization and training using some of these uh, special, uh, standardized reporting formats, uh, some focus on tech technical and operational capabilities, and then, of course, we're periodically called upon, usually at least once a year, to support some type of served agency exercise. And that request usually comes through an ARIES group uh, or something similar, um, and or, or from Mars or some other, other agency. Uh, the idea uh, here is that this uh, then is, serves as what you might call our functional or full scale exercise. And, and again, this is typically done in, in cooperation with local ARRL sections, ARIES groups, uh, or, or the um, uh, military auxiliary radio system function. Uh, and of course, uh, again, it's not enough to you know, exercise and train uh, people if they don't have the proper training. So. Uh, Radio Relay International over the last several years has developed a, uh, a number of tra uh, sequence training courses uh, with prerequisites, uh, peer review, uh, professional quality instruction. And uh, again, this is recognizing a very important reality in the MCOM community. Uh, you can go to YouTube and see all kinds of videos on how you're supposed to do things. But these YouTube videos are not only often inconsistent, but they often incorporate biases, uh, say prejudices, or forms of parochialism that are really reflective of the producer's uh, lack of experience in the uh, professional emergency management uh, uh, environment. So uh, our first and foremost goal was to develop a peer review process and then develop the plans Sure, there are and our training programs ensure that they are uh, again accurate, reflective of the realities of disaster telecommunications response. Then ensure that the professional instruction was available. And of course, uh, going with these training classes, we also have training manual, field manual, we've updated methods and practices guidelines, which is a reference uh, a document. And, and a variety of other you know, uh, factors that go into it. So uh, here you can see you know, uh, uh, guide our training classes, the class title, uh, training uh, class number, uh, recommended prerequisites for that class, and any associated training materials, what field manual you should uh, read through and have available, uh, what activities you should engage in and so forth. Uh, once somebody attends the class, they see the, they attend the entire course, and of course, they're issued a training certificate, or in some cases, a proficiency certificate for developing a requisite skill, and uh, so on. We also 
register radio operators. Uh, we'll get into that uh, in a greater slide, but you can see one of the registered radio operator certificates that we issue. So, uh, uh, you know, you know your European history, you'll get a chuckle out of the, the John Sobieski three there, but uh, you, you can Google that later. Uh, we do have affiliated programs, as I mentioned. Their, their purpose is promoting the uh, purposeful use of two-way radio. Um, I'm not going to touch on all of these. Uh, we have, uh, as a matter of fact, I probably won't go into them at all other than to, to suggest that you have a look at them. But uh, for example, during the, the telecommunications outage in Nashville, there were entire communities, entire neighborhoods that had no access to cable television, the internet, or cellular data networks, and they no longer had, they no longer had uh, telephones, you know, uh, landline telephones. So the national SOS radio network, had it been implemented by the Aries groups in the Nashville area, uh, would have had uh, the opportunity to implement this national SOS radio network. And it's very simple. Uh, radio amateurs monitor FRS channel one. Uh, so many people have these blister pack radios. They can put some AA cells in them, go up to the upper floor of their home or go out in the yard and call for assistance, say if they need 911 or if they need to find out where the local shelter is or something of that nature. Uh, and uh, we actually have pre-formatted uh, uh, PSAs that you can make arrangements in advance with local broadcast stations to uh, announce the program. There, there's all kinds of tools for this. And again, there's a whole separate course on this, so I don't want to dig too much into it. We also have the Neighborhood Ham Watch program. And, and essentially, this is designed to act as a force multiplier. So if you imagine that uh, uh, years ago, when I first got involved in, in uh, you know, emergency communications activities, uh, amateurs were, were but primarily shadow for search and rescue people or public safety officials, uh, which is very labor intensive. So the Neighborhood Hand Watch Program essentially is a methodology through which radio amateurs train the smaller VOADs, the relief agency groups, et cetera, and basic radio communications procedures, how to use two-way radios. Um, they assist them with training and exercising and they use a commonly available non-licensed or licensed radio service. It can be their choice. It can be, say, for example, GMRS is probably the most popular one because it's also interoperable with FRS radios. And then a radio amateur provides a gateway function to the broader infrastructure, the Aries net, the, uh, to WinLink, to you know, the, the RRI and TS traffic system. Uh, et cetera, right, or to the public safety answering point, uh, because most traffic and amidst this VOAD, for example, will be within the group, right? And a lesser quantity of traffic will have to move up what you might call the inverted pyramid to, say, the county EOC level or to a distant location. So the idea here is instead of having, let's say you have an SAR team of 10 guys, uh, out working different parts of a neighborhood, they can intercommunicate with a common off the shelf radio service, but perhaps there's a radio amateur who is providing that gateway function between that off the shelf radio service and the more robust and broader and more diverse amateur radio infrastructure. Uh, this not only spreads demand on telecommunication circuit capacity across more than one radio service, and it isolates some of this tactical traffic from the amateur radio networks, but it frees up valuable amateur radio operators to provide the higher value services uh, serving, say, incident demand, the emergency operations center, uh, interfacing with shares, all these other things that amateur radio has unique capabilities uh, through which they can support these other programs. So, uh, that's, uh, that's a couple of the programs. We won't get into some of the others, but, but they, they work on similar types of, of concepts. The idea here is to recognize the fact that not, not everybody involved in the communications process needs to be a ham. And uh, also, though, if you train, you promote, you organize, some of those people will take a significant interest in the purposeful use of two-way radio, and then they will go ahead 
and uh, perhaps get licensed, get involved in the ARIES group, get involved in the traffic system, develop these uh, higher level capabilities, you know, the wind link and the VPN, you know, uh, whatever, you know, the case might be. So, uh, you know, obviously standardization is important to making these, these interoperable processes work. And uh, we, re we continue to see value uh, in retaining the universal radiogram. Uh, the radiogram is really no different than the NIMS ICS-213 standard. So th there's, there's a lot of misinformation and we, we've had long discussions with FEMA about this and they just, they look at it and they say, we, we, know, we agree with you, but uh, it's like uh, trying to communicate uh, this concept with thousands of agencies around the country is overwhelming. But essentially, if you look at NIMS ICS-213, this is a government standard, okay? So I'll give you an analogy. If I run a meat packing house, okay? This sounds like a funny analogy, but it applies. If I run a meat packing house, the federal government uh, specifies certain minimum standards of inspection, cleaning, et cetera. And these are the minimum standards, okay? I am at liberty either as a corporation or as a state, for example, to implement standards that are higher, okay? So NIMS two, ICS-213 is a standard, so this is what you have to have, okay? So the NIMS ICS-213 standard, it specifies the accountability requirements, the record keeping requirements. But if I take an ICS-213 and I stick it in an email, okay, that email is gonna add all kinds of additional network management data, okay? It's going to have uh, from and to lines and routing information. Nowadays, a lot of that's hidden, you know, by the by the program, but it still exists because it's there to manage message traffic flow. Okay, radiogram is no different. If you look at the preamble in a radiogram, the header is network management data. That's all it is. It's there to provide accountability, reference, message prioritization, and to associate a specific station and his location with the individual who signs the message, say the disaster official who signs the message. Furthermore, it appends a date time group. Now, if you've ever worked in an EOC environment, let's say I'm the, let's say I'm the disaster medical director in a local emergency operations center, say county emergency operations center. And I've got five or seven hospitals in my community and they are transmitting periodic status reports indicating the number of beds that are available in their, say their ICU or something of this nature, okay? If I will be getting, if I get, say, say a hospital originates three messages, message one at noon, message two at 1230, uh, message three at one, okay? And those are placed in front of Okay, at my desk, there is a functional representative in an EOC. What happens if the first one says there's 225 beds available, the next one says there's 50, and the next one says, say, maybe there's 10? Well, what if they get mixed up? What if I don't have the proper te uh, temporal context where I go from 225 to, I guess I need to remember what my numbers are, to 75 or 10, but then 75 and 10 reverse. In other words, when you are putting the timeline together in an EOC, decision-making is heavily predicated on temporal context. That is the sequence at which information arrive, arrives. So date time group is essential in any message. I mean, this, this applies to radio amateurs, it applies to the military, it applies to public safety. It really doesn't matter what the agency is. So this information that you see at the head of a radio brand is not an affectation. Uh, it is essential data to managing the flow of messages through a complex network. All the other content is essentially identical to what you have in ICS-213. You have a two line, you have a from line, you have text, and you can add uh, within those contexts, you can add, you know, subject, you can add, you know, uh, uh, title, you can add agency, all that is available, right? So there's really no difference between the two, except that the radiogram is better suited to 
interoperability through multiple networks. So we we believe that you can create a very sound Appalachia for uh, this message format. And therefore, again, we talk about interoperability. So how does a message flow? I mean, if it, if it goes from point A to point B via your fancy digital mode, but somebody's got to pick up the phone to reach that addressee, the public safety official or whatever, well, how do you manage the complex punctuation? How do you manage the mixed case? How do you do all this, right? Uh, another myth that you occasionally encounter is the idea that greater circuit capacity is always necessary. And yes, it's always good to have greater bandwidth or circuit capacity. But remember, uh, I may be able to send 100 encyclopedias of information a minute over my uh, hypothetical digital circuit. But somebody in the incident command environment or the EOC has to read those encyclopedias. They have to comprehend it. They may have to discuss the content of those encyclopedias with their peers. They may have to do some research associated with whatever the content is in that encyclopedia. And then they have to draft a reply. Okay, so while the encyclopedias are stacking up at a very fast rate, the human brain processor is still working at the same speed it did in the time of Jesus Christ or ancient Rome. Okay. So uh, again, I stress uh, to all MCOM people, traffic handling, Aries groups, that communications is not connectivity. Communications is thought, you know, composition, drafting the message, transmitting the message through the media, whatever that is, okay? Uh, and then reading the message, discussing the message, acting on the message, drafting a reply if necessary. That's communications, it's not establishing connectivity. So this again is why we stress things in the traffic system like all capitals to make it very clear that it's not case sensitive information uh, minimize punctuation and ensure brevity. Okay, so there's often a myth that the standard radiogram is limited to 25 words. That's only applies to routine message traffic. There's never been a limit on served agency traffic. That having been said, uh, brevity, well, it's been said that brevity is the soul of wit, but in fact, brevity is the soul of emergency communications for the reasons, uh, the aforementioned reasons that we just discussed. You have to recognize the fact that even if you can transmit a 500 word message, somebody's still got to digest that data, discuss it, research it, act on it, right? So you always want to have brevity, regardless of the mode or technology used to convey information. Exceptions, of course, being things like binary files, right? You know, if you're going to transmit a spreadsheet, you're going to transmit a photo, you're going to do something of this nature. Well, that's that's a whole different different animal there. So, uh, you know, this concept of network management data appended to the radiogram is there to not just enhance accountability, but it, it facilitates the service and message and reply process. So, for example, if you have a message number, average maybe 300 messages in the course of a day within, say, an incident command environment, somebody replies back, reference message number 21, okay, I just have to dig through a file very rapidly, message 21, the addressee has a question, wonders what the context is of that reply, he can look at the original message and I can find it quickly because it has a serial number. Uh, universal time, uh, Michigan has two time zones, Indiana has two time zones, Nebraska has two time zones, et cetera. Um, if you, I think even uh, Wyoming has two time zones. So if you look at, um, again, you want to put a message, say, from uh, Omaha, Nebraska to, um, you know, say, uh, North Platte, Nebraska, uh, and you put down 1113 in Omaha, when it arrives in North Platte, well, is that 1113 or is that 1013 when that was originated? Well, I'm not sure. But if it says, you know, a 1500 Zulu, okay, when it's originated, the radio operator at the other end can very easily, knowing his own time zone, so translate that so there's no temporal confusion in the emergency management process. So again, this is just a, an overview of the fact that 
These things are not affectations, but they're a very realistic requirement. And then of course, you might ask why we convey these messages, routine radiogram messages on a 365 day a year basis. And that is the skills that you use to do this are, are universal. They apply to an unimportant message, just as they do a very critical priority or emergency message transmitted on behalf of a, an emergency management agency. So within this context, uh, again, I, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because we have a course for it, but the manual mode net structure is essentially built around traditional common denominator modes, mostly voice and, and CW, okay? And um, these nets operate 365 days a year. They're very reliable uh, when they're managed properly. And they, they offer great ability for improvisation in time of emergency. So they still retain great value. There's that whole dynamic intercommunications process that occurs person to person that doesn't occur in a pre-designed digital traffic network uh, that allows people to say, hey, let's C and D to ensure that we can reestablish connectivity or something of that nature. Uh, so that's kind of why we keep this. And, and again, this is the system of area nets, uh, region nets, okay, that cover multiple states. Then, of course, the, the section net. And so the, these, they operate in a time sequence or what you might call a time domain uh, fashion with section nets, say for example, meeting in the central area anyway, if you're like here in, in Houston at 0, 100 in the evening, uh, region nets meet at 145 Zulu, uh, cent, uh, central area net would meet at 0, 230 and so on. So traffic flows up the inverted pyramid and down the inverted pyramid based on time domain, okay? And this works great on a 365 day a year, so, you know, basis, right? Uh, however, it's not always that responsive to disaster telecommunications problems. So this time domain is the foundation for day-to-day -day operation, but not necessarily emergency response. When traffic has to move uh, between pyramids, you might say, to, um, say from central to western area or eastern to western area. Then of course, this traffic ultimately moves from the area net, what's called the inter-area traffic network, which is a series of point-to-point -point circuits uh, between these networks. And uh, these are typically uh, high-speed uh, radio telegraph nets or uh, digital networks in some cases. We also have the digital traffic network, which is uh, very much constructed in the same uh, topology uh, we have uh, perhaps uh, section hubs, uh, region hubs, and area hubs, okay? And this is a, a modified hybrid mesh network. As soon as you upload a message to a region hub, for example, your section hub, it is automatically forwarded to its destination uh, via the digital traffic network. And it is backward compatible at the region level or the local level from Pactor 1 through Pactor 3. But the infrastructure level it operates at, at Pactor 3. And maybe someday in the future, Pactor 4 will have to uh, see that. Now, I think uh, many of you have exercised the Winlink RRI gateways. So if you are utilizing the RRI radiogram templates, uh, you might uh, go ahead and uh, originate a radiogram by a Winlink. WinLink transfers that message to a region gateway, okay? And that region gateway uh, then has the duty to uh, distribute that message to its destination section using the best method uh, required. So it could be CW, it could be voice, it could be data, okay? And some of that will depend on net schedule. So let's say it's a priority message and uh, there is no digital network in session in a particular uh, section. That operator might look at his net directory and say, well, the Ohio single sideband net is meeting right now. I'll take it directly to that net. Or maybe he'll deliver it directly if the telecommunications infrastructure is there. 
So the inject points or gateways between wind link and the traffic system actually occur here. Where's my mouse? Right here at the uh, region level, okay, within the traffic system. Uh, so that's how that functions. Uh, so a little bit of insight there. As uh, uh, previously mentioned, there are two uh, types of emergency operation, or two types of operation or uh, operational configuration. One of which is routine, that's our day-to-day -day net topology and structure. And then there's emergency operation, uh, which uh, we kind of discussed earlier, the response being uh, defined uh, and specified in conformance with the National Emergency Communications Response Guidelines. Okay. And I won't go over that again. I think we can bypass that. So let's see how we're doing. I, I think we've just got about an hour there on the slides and uh, uh, a lot of information here, admittedly. So here's one of the other things that I will do is I'm going to exit that. And now if you go to our website site, there's just a tremendous amount of work product documents, et cetera. Uh, so one of the items you can look at is our uh, training manual. Uh, this is a very basic introduction to disaster telecommunications planning and theory. Uh, so you can kind of scroll through that. Uh, and so, uh, oops, how do I get this out of the way? Let's see, did I have to do that maybe? Nope, that scrolls it. I guess that's been a high thumbnail. There we go, okay. Uh, so for example, if you, you know, you can read here about disaster telecommunications planning and theory. Uh, we do have a course on disaster telecommunications planning. It's actually a, a uh, what you might call a, a simplified course. I, I taught a class at the Michigan State Police Academy for quite a, quite a few years entitled Disaster Telecommunications Workshop. And uh, we actually developed a textbook that has been printed for many years by the state, but it goes into the whole process of how you plan for uh, managing disaster telecommunications resources, circuit capacity, et cetera. So uh, this, this document kind of takes that same basic disaster telecommunications theory and, and, and takes out uh, the par parts that are pertinent to radio amateurs. Uh, so, you know, of course we have that, uh, how you apply mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery aspects of the emergency management cycle to, to uh, uh, your local emergency communications planning, hazard vulnerability analysis. You can go through and read all this stuff uh, at your leisure. Uh, and uh, it's also got a lot of information on, you know, how the uh, traffic system works, uh, you know, annual mode nets, different modes. So that's our training manual. Uh, we have a net directory on our webpage. Uh, now, many of you have probably encountered the ARRL net directory. The problem with the ARRL net directory is nothing bad about the ARRL, but it relies on individual net managers to enter the data and keep it up to date. And you can imagine this would be a little bit like, uh, oh, like uh, trying to herd uh, goats or, or uh, cats. Uh, on the other hand, what we did when we developed the net directory oh. is we went ahead and uh, Charles Hargrove of New York City Amateur Radio Emergency Communication Services took over the duty of creating a curated net directory. Uh, so uh, he updates it regularly, at least once a year, often twice a year, and at intermediate times, even if necessary. And he goes through and he ensures that this is up to date. Uh, and uh, he ensures that you have a, a modern, up-to-date searchable database here. And you go through and find nets. They're kind of subdivided based on area, uh, and then beneath area by region, and then within region by state. So for example, Western area, seventh region, Alaska, Idaho, Montana, Oregon, et cetera, uh, and the like, uh, you know, European Union, Oceania, you know, things of this nature. Uh, so you're welcome to look at that. It's on our webpage. Uh, again, our guide to training classes. Uh, we have some tools for training. For example, we have this document that can be used by local ARIES groups. So, uh, if you want to run an interesting little test, when you travel next time on business or family vacation, what I'd like you to do is find a local ARIES net and go ahead and check in with your call center. 
So for example, if I were to check in, say in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and say, this is Whiskey Bravo 8 Sierra India Whiskey, no traffic over. I can, I would be willing to bet, and believe me, I would win almost every time that the net control will not get the call sign correctly the first time. And I could probably make a lot of money by betting that he won't get it the second or third time. Now the net may sound very efficient because he recognizes the name and call sign of everybody on it. But when he hears an unfamiliar uh, call sign, he invariably cannot decode the phonetic alphabet. And of course, if you don't use the phonetic alphabet, B sounds like B, sounds like E, sounds like C, sounds like G, et cetera. Remember the old hooked on bomb commercial. There's only 30 some odd sounds. In the, I don't remember the exact phraseology, but there's only so many sounds in the English language. So now take that same net control and imagine him, say, transmitting a, a word like uh, a staphylococcus. Okay. Um, you know, Staphylococcus, I spell Sierra, Tango, Alpha, Papa, Hotel, Yankee, Lima, Oscar, Charlie, Oscar, Charlie, Charlie, Uniform, Sierra, Staphylococcus, okay? Uh, or, you know, Visceral Cranium, you know, I spell Victor, India, Sierra, Charlie, Echo, Romeo, Oscar, Charlie, Romeo, Alpha, November, India, Uniform, Mike, Visceral Cranium, okay? So, you, you look at this, you know, if you want to actually handle important message traffic, you've got to be prepared to properly use the phonetic alphabet and do so uh, correctly. So we have this tool that you can distribute to your ARIES members. And it basically lists a bunch of technical and common words and chemical terms, et cetera. Uh, and you can, for example, say uh, K8ABC uh, spell group 51. This is K to ABC, lateral. I spell Lima, Alpha, Tango, Echo, Romeo, Alpha, Lima, lateral, over. That control says, Roger, out. And then he calls maybe somebody else. Over a period of time, people can easily spell any of these words or groups. So, you know, so for example, if you look down here, uh, you know, uh, WB8SIW, spell group 105. This is WB8SIW. Initials, Foxtrot, Sierra, Tango, a uniform, over, you know, a fleet support training unit, or, uh, you know, spell group 106. Initials, Mike, Charlie, Romeo, Delta. Initials, Romeo, Tango, Bravo, November. Marine Corps Recruit Depot, Recruit Training Battalion is what that stands for, et cetera. Okay, so you can, <clears throat> you can kind of go through and use this as a training tool, right? Uh, to better prepare people for communicating that complex information. Uh, I've got a little screen here that keeps getting in the way. There we go. Uh, there's fillable radiogram and radiogram ICS-213 forms here. So you can fill them out. You can save them as PDFs, you know, et cetera. Uh, you know, uh, uh, use them to deliver message traffic. <clears throat> uh, the append a PDF radiogram or radiogram ICS-213 message to a, uh, uh, you know, to a, uh, uh, to a, uh, a served agency or an addressee by email. There are routine radiograms that you can fill out, right? You know, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, these are all available on the web page. Uh, field manual, which goes a little greater in depth as to traffic uh, network standards, et cetera. And then of course our emergency communications response guidelines are here uh, on the uh, thing with overview, alert notification, how we manage welfare priority, emergency traffic, the role of the resource manager, that network coordinator, uh, you know, the role of state and uh, local traffic networks, IATN. You know, there's a whole bunch of information in here. You're welcome to explore that. And all of that information is, is available uh, on our uh, on our web page. Uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, so uh, the address is uh, radio relay.org. And uh, up here, you can kind of see different uh, information. Here's where you can register as an RRI registered radio operator. Uh, 
publications page is probably the most useful. That's the one we're on here, where we have all the different documents, training materials, a whole bunch of different information. Um, you know, you can you can dig through, you know, reference materials and the like. Um, some information on the National SOS Radio Network, Neighborhood Ham Watch. All that and, uh, information is available to you uh, on the web page. I would like to make one final comment. And I would like to stress that we are not a membership-based organization. We do not charge dues. Uh, we are entirely nonprofit. We operate entirely on donations. And we do this to keep us honest. And we do it to ensure that we always have a motivation to be non-political um, and altruistic in our motivations. Uh, we do, however, register radio operators. Uh, and by registering, you're put on our mailing list to receive our Q&I newsletter, um, receive important operational bulletins in time of emergency. And uh, it's a essentially what you might call a social contract between RRI and the registered radio operator to ensure or encourage uh, the uh, good operating practice, uh, training, you know, inculcate good, you know, uh, good standards, you might say. Uh, so uh, if you're interested in registering, you can do so here at our webpage. And, uh, you know, that's uh, a little bit of information here. You can also apply for a mentorship program, things of that nature. So let's do this. Uh, let me go back and uh, open this guy back up. Let's see, James, my active speaker. I don't want that. Show thumbnail video. Okay, I'm going to figure out how to stop sharing my screen here. Oh, it's up here. There we go. Okay, I think I'm back. Is that correct? You're back. Jim, that was a fantastic okay. uh, presentation. Well, I appreciate that very much. I really do, Rob. Uh, do we have any questions that I can answer? Yeah, if anybody could put uh, questions in chat or raise your hand, uh, you're getting a, some thumbs up in uh, participants list and reactions. So questions in chat or raise your hand. Okay, we have a question from Michael, KC6, MEH. Uh, take it away, Michael. Hi, James. Great presentation. I noticed in the WinLink ICS form 213, it does an automatic timestamp. You said it should be in GMT time. Um, on the WinLink, it uh, stamps it with your local time, and it doesn't even indicate the time zone that you're in. Should that get fixed? I'll look into that. It's supposed to give you an option to use either local or, uh, or UTC. And so there should be a drop down box on the form that allows you to select that option. You should also mm -hmm. be able to go ahead and manually change that if necessary. So, for example, in the EOC environment, let's say that a functional representative, or say in the incident command envir environment, uh, an agency official hands me a message, the time of origin should be when he wrote out that message uh, and tendered it for origination not when it's entered into the terminal, right? So uh, it doesn't matter, of course, what methodology or mode you're using. You're quite correct that that message should always be modified to when. Oh, I think he froze. Yeah, maybe. Oh no, I'll never know. We'll wait for sure Jim to come back. Oh, Jim's back. Am I back? <laughs> yeah, you oh, perfect timing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so, uh, if, if you if you imagine that you have ten messages that have been handed to you, it might take you 10, 15 minutes to, to get all those entered into the uh, uh, terminal. Say a win link, uh, you know, uh, uh, a window, and you know. So you always want to make sure that the time of origin uh, doesn't reflect your time, your administrative time, but the time at which the agency official drafts the message. Great. Thank so I'll you. look into that, make sure there's no glitches. Oh my, yeah, I'll, I'll check that out. Yes, I noticed all the other forms seem to not indicate the time zone. So um, could that be an issue? Well, I'll check, I'll check it out. Uh, the, the default is supposed to be uh, UTC. Mm -hmm. uh, that's supposed to be the default. Uh, and then you can use 
Uh, you can use local time. Uh, it's a bit of a judgment call. So for example, if, if you know that that message is moving over, say from, uh, say from San Diego to Sacramento, you know, local time is not a problem, mm -hmm. right? But if it's if it's moving to say uh, Washington D.C., <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit of a different animal. They're mm -hmm. up to Alaska, uh, so I'll look into that and let you know. Uh, I'll get back Greg, to you. Uh, Greg, did you want to weigh in on this? Yes, uh, this is Greg kg 6 sjd You can type in whatever time you want into the uh, the time slot. Great. Yes, I'm wondering if, if uh, during emergency we need to hurry up and get these forms out, and we're defaulting to the um, automatic uh, timestamp system. Are we going to remember to do that? Well, well again, just be be aware of that. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, just be aware of, again that you know the the automatic timestamp doesn't necessarily reflect the temporal process that occurs in the emergency management environment. But uh, certainly, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll look at the forms again uh, with Steve, who's our affiliated programs manager, and, uh, Steve Hansen, KB1TCE, and the Windlink guys there, like, you know, Mike and, and so forth. And we'll, we'll make sure everything's working the way it should. Great. Greg, you okay with that? Uh, for those that don't know, Greg is the author of uh, all Windlink forms. He doesn't want to say he's the owner of them, but he puts them on the, uh, in the software. Correct. Yes. No. It, and it's easy enough. If you don't want a time, um, we can easily remove that. That's a one minute fix. So yeah, Greg, Greg's my hero. I mean, uh, you guys have been absolutely fantastic to work with. Uh, and you know, when link guys there, there, you know, there's, there's few organizations that are as responsive to the needs of the amateur radio community. Uh, Greg has, uh, I, Greg, I have no idea how many hours you've spent developing specialized forms for, for specific organizations and, and so forth, but uh, God bless you. They're doing God's work. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Thank Other you. questions, raise your hand. Uh, Michael, did you have anything else you want to lower your hand, maybe? Any other questions from the, the crowd? Put them in chat or just raise your hand. Jim, it looks like you answered all questions uh, in your presentation. Sounds good, Rob. Well, yeah, I'm a bit, uh, feel free to share my email. And if people have questions, they're welcome to contact me and uh, we'll get, get things sorted out. Good. Thank you very much. And we'll make the recording of this uh, presentation available uh, after uh, post-production processing. Hopefully get it up by uh, tomorrow morning at the latest. Thanks, Greg. Uh, thanks, Jim. And a lot of uh, chat present, uh, comments coming in. A fantastic presentation. Uh, it's a very complete. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that, guys. I really do. And uh, I, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for being here and taking time out of your Saturday. It, it's definitely appreciated. Thank you, Jim. Uh, segue, are there any other comments or announcements uh, from anybody for the good of the order before we uh, wrap up the meeting here? All right, applause coming in the reaction. So thank you, uh, everybody that helped. Uh, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, and uh, with that, we'll end the, the meeting now. Thank you all. See you Take next care. week, maybe. Yeah, see you later. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye, all.